we walked upstairs and uh, just said, look, um, we'd like to bite back. Up until that point, he was like, oh, you know, we're very small and it's not really a focus. But at that point, when we're like, oh, can we buy it back? It's like, oh. It's going to cost well, you a pretty yeah, penny. Gonna, yeah, it's really it's, growing. Exactly. <laughs> like, it, it went from one of the problem <laughs> children to, like, one of the star performers, apparently. Um, he's like, well, that's going to be expensive. From a couple of brothers-in-law getting merry in an Adelaide garage to an international wine delivery network that's hailed as one of Australia's fastest-growing companies, Vino Mofo has grown and grown fast. And it might seem like it's all happening at warp speed. But founder and chief entrepreneur Justin Dry takes a much longer view and credits a few well-timed early failures with granting him the perspective he badly needed. I'm Kelly Reardon and this is Curveball, the podcast where leaders let us in on the tough times that have shaped them. And in building his wine delivery service, Vino Mofo founder Justin Dry has bounced back from a lot of defining moments. He's quite literally lost his house, not once, but twice along the way, and learned every lesson there is when it comes to listening to your heart instead of your head. Justin Dry, welcome to Curveball. Thank you so much for having me. Look, is this business all just basically an elaborate excuse to sit around and drink wine at work? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know what? It certainly came from that passion, so probably. Where did this entrepreneurial spirit first come from? Like before wine, which I assume you don't get into until you're sort of 17, 18, where's the business now and the entrepreneurial kind of instinct coming from? I had it as a, as a kid. I was surrounded by, I think um, my uh, dad was an entrepreneur, you know, had some successes, some failures, um, but it was always a topic of conversation because they were business owners and they had various businesses when I was growing up. And so it was always that conversation around the dinner table. Um, and then it was just in, I think it was just in my DNA. I, the first book I ever read or purchased, I should say, not read, I was forced to read other books before it, but it was <laughs> um, uh, Think and Grow Rich. And I was like 12 wow. or maybe 13. And I just loved it, you know, and it was pretty old school now when I look back at it. Um, and some of the things it says is really quite wrong. But that kind of gives you an indication of what I was interested in back then. And, you know, my first business was when I was 10. Uh, it was a lawn mowing and um, car washing business. I was that annoying kid that knocked on the neighbor's doors and asked, <laughs> asked to do stuff for you. It was just like $2 a car. It was cheap. Um, <laughs> my business model was a little bit off, but uh, that was my first one. Then I did like I, I'd sold Christmas trees when I was 14. I bought them from a Christmas tree farm, sold them on a corner, a busy what? corner. Yeah, it was nuts. Um, and I, I just kept doing those things. I was really interested in creating stuff and and I found it really fun. So I I don't know, it's just been, I think, part of my DNA. I think one of the things you were watching quite early was your dad, who was a business owner who'd done many things. What were some of the early lessons you learned from him? Oh, good question. (laughs) Um, A lot of what not to do. Sorry, Dad. I loved his energy around businesses. You know, I still do. And I think I learned about, you know, doing stuff that you're passionate about. I think I learned about kind of like creating a really exciting big picture, you know, from him. He was so, you know, optimistic and enthusiastic and excitable um, about business and it kind of is contagious. Also learned a lot of good lessons around obviously what not to do because there was a few failures there. And, you know, we are both not, and I say this without having chatted to him about it, but very good with detail. And so I've surrounded myself with incredible people to um, look after that part of it, whereas I think that was one of his kind of challenges. He, he didn't. He ended up running a few businesses, as I mentioned, and one of them was in the health and gym industry, I think in the 80s, when I imagine in Australia there's both money flowing around, but then we also have the recession we had to have. He was a really successful uh, younger professional in insurance game, and he's had a lot of really um, interesting successes in his time. But uh, during that period, he kind of went, oh, you know, this health space, he, he loved gyms, he loved fitness, and he got into the gym space and opened a couple and uh, I think, you know, mortgaged his house to do it, um, as a lot of great entrepreneurs do, you know, throw it all in. Um, and then 
I think it was around that time. I've probably blocked out half of this, <laughs> to be honest. But it was about that that time when interest rates flew up to like 18% or something ridiculous. <sighs> and, you know, he'd borrowed the money to invest in the business and then the, the interest rates, I, I, I don't even think people could imagine those today. Well, certainly people that haven't seen them, but <laughs> but I, I can. And I saw them and I saw us lose our house and everything around it. So, um, yeah, it was really, I think it was about, 10 or 12 at the time. This made me reflect on something in my own family, which is my dad was a solicitor but didn't really love doing that. And so eventually, you know, sold off his um, legal practice and my mum and dad bought indoor cricket centres. Oh, amazing. That would have been fun as a kid though. (laughs) (laughs) And so this is at the time when that was really taking off in the sort of early 80s. Probably mortgaged the house to do this as well. I don't know and I feel like I need to know more about this story now. But I can also really imagine what it would have been like if that really went belly up and I watched that as a kid. Can you lean in a little bit to to what you then saw and, and witnessed when it did go under? I remember the day there was a door knock and it was the first time I'd ever kind of felt like uneasy uh, around that situation because it was the kind of first interaction I'd had and it was one of the creditors and I think um, they were taking the car. I think that's what they were doing um, and I answered the door and so pretty confronting for a kid not know. You could feel the energy. You could feel it was there was something wrong but you didn't really know what the consequences were yet um, and I know my parents had thrown everything in on it and I know that they'd been under a tremendous amount of pressure because um, you could feel that and, you know, I think it's had lifelong um, impact on me, some of it good, some of it not. But I just I remember that day like it was yesterday when the guy knocked on the door and I I could sense something was wrong and then the car went and then over a period of time the house was sold, the family moved into a, a rental, um, we borrowed someone's car. So we went from nice cars, nice house to a pretty average existence and I didn't have a full understanding of what that actually meant but I certainly um, could sense that there was something not good going on and I could feel the pain and the fear um, within the family. So, yeah, it wasn't a great experience. Simultaneous to that growing up, though, the other big passion for your family is wine. Tell me how that unfolded for you as a teenager. Yeah, I I had a couple of uncles that were in the wine industry. One was um, quite a well-known viticulturist, Peter Dry, and he wrote a lot of the textbooks I ended up studying at uni. He's, he's flown over the world to consult. Um, he's, he's really considered up there. And, um, and another uncle, Ian, um, who's more on the sciencey side of it. And um, I would go to family events, you know, Christmases, and they would be, and they knew I was, you know, had a little bit of an interest, but, you know, I was pretty much force-fed wine. I, they'd line me up glasses and go, all right, we want you to tell us like the region, the vintage, the variety in this blind tasting type thing. And I was like, <laughs> I was like 16. And I was like, I don't even drink yet. Or I probably did. I, I probably drank vodka or something naughty. Um, but I, I was, I was, uh, yeah. And I'd be going through, well, how, how am I supposed to do that when I don't know wine? And they kind of guided me through it. And they were like, all right, so if it's this variety, look for this. If it's this vintage, maybe look for these things. Um, and so, I don't know, I guess I was kind of force fed a little bit early and then I just fell in love with it and later found out that um, some of my ancestors planted some of the first vines in the Barossa, so that too was in my DNA. Mm. Yeah, so... And, and then you work in a few wine shops, you, you work for wine reps, you're sort of in that industry, but you decide, actually, I'd like to go to university, I think study stockbroking. And I imagine timing-wise, again, is this a boom time or a leading into the dot com crash? Is this bus time that you're in stockbroking? <laughs> I, I went and studied actually uh, a wine marketing, uh, uh, which was marketing with a wine focus first um, and then worked in wine shops after that and did vintages, etc. And at some point um, I decided that maybe well, I was questioning whether wine was a passion or a profession. And I was like, well, you know, maybe it's a passion. And, I, and I'm, I've always been interested in business and um, markets and investments and a whole bunch of other things. So why don't I try something else for a while um, and it was it was at that time I think you know the tech boom was happening so like late 90s um, and and so I went and studied financial markets worked at a stockbroking firm uh, based out of uh, Adelaide where I was living at the time and did that for a while and like everything I touched turned to gold all my friends thought I was a genius because I was I was just playing in the tech stocks because that's what I was interested in and um, it was boom time but I was still there a year later when the, the tech crash happened and I did not seem so smart. Mm. 
The other thing that happened around this time is is you put some money into some property developments that went quite well, but then you invested or put some effort into something that didn't go so well. I think once the tech crash had happened and I was like, oh, this is not so fun anymore. Um, and, you know, a few of the investments that I'd made in tech space uh, had worked, some hadn't, but the little bit I had left, I then took off uh, the table and approached the guy who had some land um, down south in South Australia and somehow convinced him to sell me two big parcels of land. And I had a few friends that were in the property development game and I was like, oh, I can do that, you know, subdivide the land, contract a builder, um, sell it off plan and, you know, it'll, it'll work perfectly. And so I, I convinced this uh, old guy, Mike, a great guy, um, and I don't know why he was convinced, but he was. And so I, I signed to uh, buy two big parcels of land next door to each other and I was going to turn them into two different developments. And um, I went to, I had like not much money, so I hired uh, a reasonably priced, should I say, architect. It wasn't an architect, it was a building designer. Uh, and I got some drawings done. I uh, hired a, a real estate agent who was getting paid on commission only. Uh, and I went to council and got these plans approved uh, and then pre-sold all 15 places uh, within a few months. And that gave me the money to buy the land and subdivide the land and um, settle on those and then do the um, development. Uh, and build the 15 houses, and that was a great success. And I was like, oh, this is good. Um, you know, mid-20s, killing it. Yeah, absolutely. But big risk. You took a big gamble there. That that sort of house of cards has come unstuck for a lot of people. Yeah, and, and for me too. Um, mm. But it's – and then I was like, well, okay, and then the next lot. And I, uh, there was 28 – of those and um, pre-sold uh, most of them and settled and that paid for it. And I was, so I was sitting there, you know, I had houses and cars and great travel and this great lifestyle at, you know, mid, late 20s. And I was thinking, this is, um, this is great. This is fun. I love this. Um, and, and then uh, the, the, the downfall <laughs> of that was um, uh, someone I cared about deeply uh, was in trouble and um, they needed help getting out of getting out of that, and asked me to um, go guarantor on something. Um, and so I, what I did was I, I, I split up. I had a company and I had some personal assets, etc. I decided that I would um, I would do it, but I'd do it in the company. So and the limit to limit the guarantee to that entity, not my personal stuff. Um, fast forward two weeks, the loan docs get drawn up. I go into the bank and to sign, and I notice that they've got my personal name attached to it as well, not just the company name. And so I was like, well, I didn't agree to that, and um, we need to change that. And they're like, oh, so sorry, so sorry, didn't mean to, 100%. We'll get it changed. We'll take a couple of weeks. And I was like, okay, but what? I didn't know at the time, but soon did, was that um, the uh, button was going to be pushed on the other loans that I was guaranteeing. And so if I didn't sign it that day and get it done, it was all over. And so I was sitting there going, oh, God, I know this is stupid. Like my gut is saying, God, no, do not do it. My head is saying, don't be stupid. And um, But my heart there, I, you know, I cared a lot and I just wanted to give them the opportunity to have a go at getting out of it. Um, I believed in them and that's what I did and I signed it. And fast forward another four months and all the loans got called in. So you did know at the time, you did have a feeling this is a really stupid risk, but I'm just in a hurry. Like you, you genuinely sort of thought this could go pear-shaped and you realised, but you went on with it anyway. Yeah, I was young. And I think um, if I you know, had my time, you know, people would say no regrets. Well, um, <laughs> I have a few. Mm. Uh, no, I, I think there was, there was just youth and it was, you know, I, me just wanting to help and save and um, support. I've got this, I, I do have this thing uh, with my family that I like, I'm almost like the protector. I, I just want to look after and make sure they're, they're okay. And so that's what, that's what I was doing. And um, I knew it was the wrong, I knew it was the wrong call, but I was kind of trying to convince myself, but look, I, you know, I believe they, they deserve another shot and they'll get out of this. And unfortunately they didn't, and it took everything down with it. What do you think you learnt during this period? We'll never sign personal guarantees, <laughs> <laughs> for one. And, and honestly, uh, I've never signed one since. So that was one thing. Uh, second was probably it was probably the start of 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 understanding how right my gut often is. 
um, you know, like there's, you know, you can go with your heart and you're not making a great decision often. Um, you know, you can think things through and a lot of those decisions are, uh, are, are often right. But, you know, I, I've learned so many times since that if something just feels a little bit off in my gut, there's something off. And so I think that was probably that, that first riddle. It wasn't even like a gentle, <laughs> that was a slap in the face. And this is, you know, that tummy compass. It's just so important, isn't it? Oh, so important. The other thing for me is like you do this having already been through a bankruptcy situation with your family. So... Like the stakes are incredibly high here. The buck stops with you. How did you not wallow in this failure? I think that looking back at it, um, I, I went through a, a couple of years where I wasn't living the best kind of lifestyle <laughs> post that. So when you say wallow, it probably was a form of wallowing. You know, I knew I needed to, uh, you know, dust myself up, get up and um, get on with it because I needed to um, get back very resilient in that way and uh, I knew that um, I had to do it myself if someone was going to do it but having said that like I, I did kind of wallow for a couple of years to be honest like one part of my life was like I need to fix this I need to get back I need to you know head down bum up and just work to get out of this and then the other part of me was probably living a life that was probably a little bit kind of naughty in the sense of, you know, kind of, um, you know, trying to escape responsibility, probably um, having a little bit too much fun. And so I was kind of, for a period of time, I, do, I wouldn't say I was wallowing because I was getting stuff done, but I was certainly not living the optimal <laughs> life. So you head off to South America then, and at this time, Facebook is taking off and you get this idea for Quaff. Tell me exactly what Quaff was. So Quaff was our first attempt at an online wine business and basically it was Facebook for wine. So I just niched what Facebook was to a much smaller audience that was focused on wine and it kind of it was it was born out of like so you could friend up and recommend and like stuff and so it was very much Facebook but for wine and built up quite a good community but it was based on this idea that um the wine world needed to change. The way we were talking to the young generation of wine drinkers needed to change because for a mid-20s, I knew a lot about wine. And so when you know a lot about wine, you're interested in kind of um, going to small independent wine shops and finding um, really interesting wines, whether they be Barolos or Barbarescos or Burgundies or something a little bit more weird and wonderful. Um, you're going searching for these incredible wines. And I would walk into these wine stores and there was always this old guy behind the counter with rosy cheeks and bow tie and he got an entire <laughs> self-worth from making you feel small because he knew more about wine than you and I was like wow if I feel intimidated imagine how people that don't have my experience in wine feel I was like that's rubbish we need to change the way people are uh, learning about wine um, or they won't be interested in exploring it more so that's where it kind of came from it was the you know taglines no bow ties and no bs be passionate super passionate but, but no need to be a wanker is basically where that brand came from and that's what Quaff was born out of. And then how did you transition that online community into Vino Mofo? How did that play out? Uh, in a couple of steps, um, each one I thought was the idea. It didn't end up being, but in hindsight, <laughs> they were kind of like stepping stones on the way because um, they all kind of contributed their own thing to the eventual product, which would be Vino Mofo. So the first one was Quaff, which was a, a Facebook for wine, which was about building this younger community who believed in wine and the, and the way we talked about it. And then the second one was a thing called Road to Vino, which, you know, I'd always wanted to buy a combi and travel around Australia surfing. So I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I filmed it and we went to wineries. <laughs> and um, so like this crazy, good, fun um, idea. Um, we got sponsorship from Wine Australia and a whole bunch of regions to do it. It was, it was so much fun. And that kind of built our network of uh, wine producers. So the first one was audience. The second one was producers. Because when you're filming a show, um, it was like an online wine TV show. Um, one of the first ones on YouTube in that space. And so we're traveling to these great wine regions and, and choosing who we want to catch up with. And so we when you're doing that, you're like, all right, so I want to catch up with all the legends and I want to catch up with all the young rock star winemakers that are going to be amazing in years to come. So that's what we did. We kind of picked who we wanted to catch up with and 
and went and filmed the show, you know, traveling around in a combi and just drinking too much and, you know, sleeping in the car and, or, you know, having these great experiences um, with these amazing uh, producers. And that kind of built our network of um, wine producers. So we had the audience, we had the producers. And then the next one before Vino was called um, uh, Great Australian Wine Adventure, which was a mobile check in app. So where you can check into locations now on, you know, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Um, back then, there was a couple of apps around um, uh, Go Walla and Foursquare were the originals. And so we kind of built that, but for the wine industry. So we got our audience um, together with our producers and got them like traveling to the wineries and checking in. And when they checked in, they'd get a special offer. So like that was kind of the introduction of deals. Um, so, you know, check in at, you know, Penfold and get a back vintage tasting, for example, or check in at like some young cool brand and get um, a tasting with the winemaker um, or, you know, various kind of things like that. And so, uh, and that went really well. We had like a couple hundred wineries sign up. We had, you know, 20 or 30,000 wine lovers traveling around the country, checking into different locations. And they would do like five or six in a row in one region. Um, you know, they'd do the Riesling tour or the Shiraz tour. Or, and so it's really fun and really good and it, what it did was so first one's audience second one's producer network third one's kind of deals and offers and then bring those all together in late 2010 um, in Vino Mofo. And the thing about Vino Mofo is there's this real sense of play and like even the the name, everything about Vino Mofo um, kind of is fun and playful and, and away from that sort of snobby wine, you know, connoisseur that you, you mentioned before. Did that stem out of just kind of you naturally because that's kind of how you are or was that sort of a deliberate market strategy that you knew would work? Uh, the second one sounds much too smart for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's absolutely the first. It, uh, we built everything we built for us. It was like we were our audience, you know. It was like uh, it, it's just far easier and far more genuine and far easier to maintain if it's um, authentic and um, and that's exactly what it was. We were building this for us. This is the way we talked about wine. This is the way that we experienced wine. This is what we wanted out of a out of a wine experience, and that's and so that's what we built. You started Vino Mofo with your then brother in law Andre. How did the two of you decide to team up? Uh, that was a Christmas day um, after a few bottles of wine and mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd, I'd come back from South America and he had been working in the wine industry shooting videos for wineries um, after working a little bit of time selling wine on, uh, on the phone um, before that. But so he was, he was in the industry and he had this idea for a wine site, which I think it was, it was called Red Cellar and it was just um, like a wine sales site, I think. And I came back with this other idea, which was the Facebook for wine. And so we have a few wine, uh, wines over Christmas Day, feeling a little bit tipsy, and we start telling each other about our business, respective business ideas. And we're like, oh, my God, we're going to actually gonna be competitors. Um, so let's go into the office and, and you show me what you're doing and I'll show you what I'm doing. And then we were like, what if we combine them? Um, and kind of and did both of them. His thing was very much around like customer reviews and mine was very much about community. Um, and so we kind of put those together and that was quaff. And what did your sister think of all of this? Because it's kind of risky going into business with like blood family, but when it's kind of in-laws, you know, it's always like, it's going to work. Yeah, you. <laughs> I, I think she was probably nervous. Um, <laughs> but, but I also think um, she liked the idea because I think she could see that we both brought different things to the business. And I think she also, you know, starting as a solo founder is lonely. So to have someone to um, uh, work together on uh, a new project is, is, I think there's a lot of benefits. And and Vino Mofo starts to grow quite quickly. Um, What was your strategy? Was it, you know, build and scale quite quickly or is that just how it transpired? The strategy was very much about we built this incredible community so it was about um, getting our community to help us grow so referrals were huge for us early um, and but you know to be honest when the first day we launched we were like we were going to be stoked if we sold 20 cases and 
um, in the, our first deal because it started as a deal a day kind of thing. It was about that time that Groupon was the fastest growing company in the world. Uh, and so we kind of introduced that to the wine space with our audience and producers. And so we were like, oh, could you imagine if we just like we did this pre sign up campaign to our community? So we had a lot of people on the, uh, as members when we signed up. And we we're like, if we could just sell you know, 20 cases on the first day because we're only doing one deal. And uh, we sold like 43. And we're like, whoa, <laughs> that's cool. Because, um, you know, it's more than we'd sold in the previous month <laughs> in, the, in the other wine, online wine business we had. Uh, and so we're like, oh, that's amazing. Uh, oh, but we've probably, um, if that's probably it, like, you know, uh, all the members have probably bought all they're going to buy. So tomorrow might be a really sad day for us. And then the next day we sold more. And we're like, oh, no, okay, oh, that's exciting. But no, that's probably it now. Um, and then the third day we sold more. And then we sold more <laughs> and then we sold more and we were like, and it can, the audience kept growing um, because people loved the concept and the fact that we were obviously selling premium, super premium wine, but at prices they'd never seen before. And they loved the fact that it was so focused and curated and it was wines we loved. And so they kept telling their friends. And so our audience was growing and we kept selling more and more and more. And so I think probably early, we probably weren't, um, we weren't probably confident enough to have <laughs> the ambition um, that we now do. Yeah, and every business has those sort of growing pains at some point. But I think for you guys with scale, I'm interested in that first year because I think it's only about a year after launch that you you, th- you start to talk to Catch of the Day, which we'll come to shortly about buying a stake in your business. But I'm really keen to understand, could you go from sort of small to, you know, mid-size in a year without – it having some sort of impact on your brand or you as individuals? Uh, I, look, I think what's funny when like each of the milestones, we didn't actually really take our time um, to appreciate because we were just like, because it's, it's, everything was moving so fast and there was so many challenges that we were just running a million miles an hour and super excited about what the next deal was, what the next release was as far as tech or um, what the next team hire was. So we were running a million miles an hour and we didn't really appreciate just how fast we were growing and the opportunities that were going to be presented to us um, over the next you know, 12 to 24 months. So um, I don't know if it changed us at all, apart from the fact we were got a little bit more excited because, wow, this thing was taking off and we just didn't want to stuff it up, to be honest. <laughs> we were like, just, it's working, it's working, just don't stuff it. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if it changed us, probably just got us a little bit more excited. But it's only a year or so after launch that you face, you know, a pretty big crossroad, which is that you're prompted to sell, I think, 70% of the business to the Daily Deals website Catch of the Day. What prompted that? Uh, We had a few challenging um, months there where basically when you started, we were small and um, insignificant to the other competitors in the market. But as soon as we started getting traction and um, lots of attention, uh, that changed. And so all of a sudden our producers were being told if they dealt with us um, that their product would be pulled from the shelves of other competitors. And so because we were one deal a day, there was a limited uh, amount that we could offer a winery because we could feature them. Uh, we could feature one wine once every you know month or two at best. So we weren't a full solution. And so we needed to we needed to scale up really quickly um, in order to become something that was significant enough in the producer's eyes for them to take the risk to tell the other guys where to go. And so when you're you know when you're small and you're only selling a little bit, it it's not as easy for them to make that kind of call with some of the um, people that they're supplying that are taking a huge amount of wines and volume. So we needed to scale and that was where where the, that kind of next conversation came from. Um, we did something in, in the meantime to try and help delay that that challenge for producers because you know we'll a deal a day which means if a deal went up and then all of a sudden two hours later we got a call from the producer saying please take it down please take it down um i've been threatened this um and if you don't take it down i'm going to lose um uh, I'm going to lose that retailer, for example. And so we're like, oh, my God, these are our friends. Like this is how we got such incredible deals are our friends and family. And so we would pull a deal, um, and which meant you lost your day sales pretty much or the first, you know, the last 22 hours of it. Um, and so then eventually um, we came up with something called the secret deal. 
So we would put up this wine offer. Um, we wouldn't put the label up and we'd just describe it with, uh, you know, 96 points from James Halliday. It's a Shiraz from the Barossa. Hints of wet, dry grass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or- yeah. All, all those wine wanky <laughs> words. Um, and you would do, but you would you would talk about this incredible wine that you had for this incredible price, but you wouldn't tell them what it was. And so that was the creation of the secret deal. It came because we needed to hide it from other <laughs> retailers. Um, so we could protect producers. So they would keep giving us wines. And the first time we went up, uh, one went up, uh, we sold twice as much as we normally would. And we're like, whoa, this is interesting. And then these whole communities like and forums online started getting together to work out what the wine was. I mean, this is phenomenal, isn't it? Like you're just basically inventing it on the run and every time you reinvent around a problem – you end up killing it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's you know, it's funny, but you know what happened then? Our competitors started buying all of our secret deals so they could find out <laughs> what they were. And it was, it's so funny because one of one of the bigger ones uh, ended up becoming one of our best customers um, because they were buying so many of our secret deals to find out what it was to then cause an issue for the producer who agreed to it. And so we were like, oh, this is, you know, thank you for thank you for introducing the need for this concept because it's really helped the business and it's fast tracked everything because people are so excited about this adventure and this and this like not knowing and trying to find out. So thank you for that, but we still need to fix this problem. Um, so then we went looking for money because the one thing that was going to fix it was scale like proper scale. And so we went looking for uh, money. We chatted to angels. We um, And to be honest, it was so funny with the angels because we'd pitched them three or four other business ideas um, before that, you know, all the different um, versions before, and we didn't have a single hand up really. They said, oh, it's fun, it's cool, but I don't know how it's going to make money and probably fair enough. But when we pitched them Vino Mofo, every single hand went up. <laughs> they wow. Were like, they were like, all right, we're, we're interested now. Um, and so we had that option. We, had, we were talking to a major media player who, wanted to share uh like 20 30 percent i think it was at the time and um and then we were about to do the deal with the media player and uh we get a call after like it was i think it was around christmas time uh, oh no early in the new year that's right because we were supposed to do the deal with the media company just before christmas and we we're so excited because we'd had such average christmases <laughs> for the last four or five years because we had no money we we're like oh this is going to be a great christmas uh and then they didn't settle in time and we we're like oh and it fell out of um exclusivity period and all these things and so we were just we were quite depressed to be honest and then we get this call in the new year and it's the ceo and one of the founders of catch and uh and said hey don't don't do any other deals do a deal with us we want to buy you and we're like well oh that's interesting but you know we're kind of really deep down into the process with this other deal and they said yeah yeah but we'll pay you more we're we're good at this we win every vertical we enter um we've got a huge audience this is what we do do not sign up with a media player so they're really pitching against we're like well we're deep down and like but you are pretty convincing (laughs) especially the bit with we'll pay you more um and and the fact that they were really successful they had millions of customers and and they had this audience so we're like oh that's interesting I I think to put this in context for people as well, you know, I think at this time, which I guess is around 2012, um, Vino Mofo's revenue is kind of in, you know, single figure millions, you know, it's four or five million. Oh, it's less. Less. Yeah, it's less. It's like two, I think. Yeah. Okay. And catch of the day, meanwhile, is turning over in excess of about 200 million at the same time. So, so you're of kind of a small fish about to play in the very big... (laughs) The we're, big pond. We were a pimple on the, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we were tiny compared. Okay, and so the thing about this, Justin, is with my company, Dead Set Studios, which is barely 10 months old, I am now talking to a couple of investors. And so I want to really pick your brain <laughs> about this, right? Yes. So um, they obviously have deep pockets, but they wanted a bigger stake than the media company. How did you decide, yep, we'll sell off, what, 60 70% to catch? Yeah, it was 70%. And how did we decide? I think we were excited about the the scale that they already had in um, in a similar business model. And so you've got 2 million customers or thereabouts, I think it was, and you had they had three or four verticals. That was their play back then. They, were, um, they had catch, which was the main business, and then they were entering verticals. They had like mums and babies. They had groceries. They had a few others, and they wanted us as the wine one because they'd played around with wine, but it hadn't really worked I don't think and so they wanted someone people that knew the wine industry so 
that's why they approached us and we're like, well, they've done it before. They're really successful with the verticals they've um, launched. Catch is obviously really successful. They know the model really well and they've got the resource to really scale up, um, be it through customer or or, or money um, resource. And so we're like, that's really exciting. Whereas the other one was less so. And also they were founders, you know, they, they just it just felt more like a natural fit. There was a couple of brothers started in the garage um, and they had that kind of same attitude to kind of um, business and life and growth. And so that was probably the reason we went that path. And so you've done your homework. You've made sure there's good alignment. You've made sure there's a way for Vino Mofo to grow through this deal. You've probably made some great money, but this ended up not being quite what you hoped for. So what happened? The customer crossover wasn't quite what we expected. We did that old thing where we're like, oh, if there's there's like 2 million customers, let's take 10% of them. We've got 200,000. That's like huge (laughs) as a business uh, for us. And so um, that didn't kind of um, translate uh, in the end. what What we got, there was a very different customer base. So we were always selling like premium, super premium wines in a deal format, but it was like always premium. Catch of the day is a bargain thing, yeah, right? It's yeah, shopper yeah. docket. Yeah, that kind. Yeah. And so their audience was very much around like, you know, uh, spending three, four, five dollars a bottle type thing. And that just wasn't the place that we were playing in. And so probably we had less crossover. And that was kind of, I guess, unexpected at the time. But, you know, in hindsight, you go, oh, that makes sense. But with such big numbers, you're like, oh, it, there's got to be enough to make it interesting. Yeah. So that was the first challenge. Um, it was around just uh, how suited the customer bases were um, or business models and, uh, and, and product offer, I should say, um, across the customer bases. And so that was the first one. The second one was uh, after about six months or a year, Catch had decided really to le- focus less on verticals and back into the main business because what they realized, I think, um, and probably better ask Gabby and Hetty about this than me. But <laughs> the CEO, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and um, founders. And, and so, um, but what I think they realised was when you're going into verticals, you're creating um, layers for each vertical. You know, you're, you're kind of creating, um, you know, you need managers and buyers and you need other layers added on top of each vertical to operate that vertical, whereas that main business was so successful um, and, and, and such a great engine that was run quite lean it didn't have all those extra costs. So I think they kind of had this, this uh, had made the decision to then go back, all right, let's focus on the main one and stop adding cost centers um, to run verticals. And so I think that's, so we were one of those. Um, but uh, so we are like, well, what does that mean for us? <laughs> um, what happens now? Because, you know, we're seeing the focus go back onto the main and less on the verticals. And we literally are, I think, the smallest or the second smallest vertical <laughs> within the group. Um, but this is our everything. You know, this is, this is means so much to us, um, but it's so small in comparison to the engine that was catch that um, we're like, where does this leave us? So then we chatted to Gabby, um, who you know was still. So, so hang on, just to sorry. stop there, the, your head, you know, your head is in your hands at this point, right? This baby that you've built, all the incarnations, you sell off a big chunk. You must be thinking, oh my god, what the hell have we done? You guys decide to call. Catch of the day founder Gabby and and what beg for your stake back like what what did you say? We walked upstairs um, to Gabby's bigger office and um, said, "Can we chat?" And uh, just said, "Look, here's um, what we're thinking. Um, you know, obviously we're we're tiny in comparison. Focuses are changing. We love this business. Um, we'd like to buy it back." And so he was. He was like, you know, up until then, he was. Like, uh, his, I, I love Gary. He's, he will say, he says some crazy stuff, but I love him. Um, and he will just go. And he just said, uh, up until that point, he was like, oh, you know, we're, we're very small and it's not really a focus. But at that point, when we're like, oh, can we buy it back? He was like. Oh, it's going to cost well, you a pretty yeah, penny. Gonna, yeah, it's really it's, growing. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It went from like... A few the, extra zeros since yeah, yeah. I sold it, uh, yeah. bought it from you. Yeah, yeah. It's like it, it went from one of the problem <laughs> children to like one of the star performers, apparently. Um, it's like, well, that's going to be expensive. And we're like, ugh. <laughs> and without, without sort of, I don't want to put you to name figures here, but like in terms of, can you give me a sense of the scale that you had to buy it back at as opposed to selling it? Like, was it really crippling? 
Oh no, no, but we gave everything back, you know, like yeah, and and we brought in uh, we brought in investors to manage um, that as well. So we brought in twenty five percent investors in the company to help us, um, and you know the uh, founders all gave money back um, uh, that they'd uh, taken on the acquisition part of it, and so you know we went in. I think I think by the time the deal got done. Our revenue was about four, and I think we left at eight. Um, so it was it, like it, it grew a hundred percent, but we were pretty much on that trajectory anyway. Uh, and you know there wasn't the, the crossover in customers, so we were kind of on that path regardless. Um, obviously, the media attention and the fact that we're now part of the big boys in that kind of e-com space kind of helped with, you know, negotiation, resource, et cetera. But we didn't actually draw any money, I don't think, um, into the business. So we gave all the money back and got some other money in to help um, and did the deal, which I'm forever thankful for. You know, Gabby and Hezzy, they understood. They're founders. They're like, we get it, you know, and probably you're pretty small, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> Will Justin Dry be able to rescue his company back and build it up? That's all next on Curveball. This is Curveball. I'm Kelly Reardon. Justin Dry is an entrepreneur who's rallied after losing everything, including his house and cars, not once, but twice. He's the co-founder of Vino Mofo, which he started out in his Adelaide garage with the help of his brother-in-law, Andre. Justin, despite selling a stake of your company to catch of the day and then buying it back again, you go on to raise another record level of investment. And I'm just wondering, what made you go down that fundraising path again? We bought the business back in June 30, 2013. And so for the next few years, we got back to our roots. We got lean and we were growing super fast and we won like lots of awards, like, you know, best startup, with culture, like lots of them. And so th- we had this great energy and um, it was so exciting and we, we, we were doubling every year and it was just fantastic. We grew, you know, we were the fastest growing uh, tech company in Australia over a three-year period um, during that kind of time. And and so it was really, it was really fun. And then we were maturing and we were investing in our team and um, and we're getting to a size where it was, um, it was, looking like we wanted to, you know, double down um, and get even bigger and become one of the big guys um, and also um, test it out globally. And so the reason we went looking for funding was one, to reward some early shareholders um, that were still on the journey with us to give them the opportunity to sell a little bit down. But two was growth capital. Like we were growing fast, but let's really kind of turn this up. Let's go Let's go global. But this had gone badly for you once before. So, so <laughs> <laughs> this is what I find so fascinating, right? Like it makes sense on a piece of paper, except you've done that and it tanked and it didn't work. So what, what was it, what was different about seeking that investment from Blue Sky Ventures and I think it was a record amount of money that they put into you. Yeah, I think at the time, I think it's been dwarfed now many times over. But um, what made I think we we were looking for capital for like to get the growth both globally and Australia. So that was important. Um, around making mistake before, you know, I, I've made a million mistakes. You know, we've <laughs> the company has made plenty of mistakes, but but I think you got to have a shot. You know, like if if you're not having the shots, you're never going to get the successes. So um, while there's a lot of failures along the way, um, it's important to keep trying. I've never let any of those failures get in the way of what I see as the best next move. And so we were going to do it. We wanted to scale. We wanted to go global. And so we started looking for money. And is that path that you seek for funding, like is it always venture capital that you need to go high growth? Is is there a point where you can look at some other option? I, yeah, I, absolutely. And I think as a business matures, you can look at more traditional sources of funding. But, you know, early, it's higher risk. And so the more traditional um, sources of funding aren't really available as a lot of the business owners listening would understand. So I think, you know, early, it's about, it's either about, you know, seed funding from friends and family, then it becomes maybe about, you know, angels investing, which is that next level up. And um, then it's VC. And then if you get big enough, it's probably P or IPO. So, you know, there's there's lots of different choices, but 
at some point when the business is mature enough, as I said, more traditional kind of bank funding becomes available if you so choose. But, you know, back then it just wasn't available for that kind of scale um, and for the purpose that we wanted to use it for. So we fast forward a couple of years, you guys are doing really well, you're growing, all the plans are falling into place. But in 2018, your co-founder, who's also your brother-in-law, Andre, he decides to step down from his role and you step up even further, I think, to become really the driving force, the face of the business. How did that feel for you personally? We'd always been co-CEOs through that period and our skill sets were very different. And so we'd always kind of focused on the bits that made sense within a business. And then when we decided to go sole CEO, um, it, it was it was a big thing. But, you know, the business had got to a certain scale that you had the, um, the people around you to make that possible. But um, it was still a big thing, you know, it was, it was our baby and I was taking the lead and um, it was now my responsibility to make sure that this was um, going to be a success and it achieved everything that um, we could achieve. Even with the absolute best of intentions, partnerships are really difficult, right? Even if everyone sets off on the right footing and, you know, works really hard together and, and you know, it's a cohesive partnership for a long time. Did you have a plan? for how to resolve any differences once you did decide to go different ways? No, we, we had a board. <laughs> so obviously we've, uh, over the years and certainly through in investment rounds, we've built up a great board. And so we've got advice there. We've got business mentors. We've got business and life coaches. We've got all those things around us to help make that um, easier. But, you know, it was... It was. It certainly changed. I think we matured as as business people over the years. But early, you know, we would just uh, we would just disagree and have arguments. He has exited the day to day running of the business, but as I understand, is still um, a shareholder or a director. Is does that make it difficult for you to sort of still feel like you need to seek his counsel on big decisions, or did you just sort of split it off there and go, okay, I'm now running the place. No, I mean, I guess uh, ultimately I'm responsible to for the to the board at that time as CEO. I've, I've since changed into chief entrepreneur, but um, as a CEO, you're ultimately responsible to the to the board. And um, he was on the board for for some time, and he has, but he's exited that too. So he's still a shareholder, but he's not on the board or within the business. So it was very much um, focused on what I was doing as the sole CEO. Um, and what the board and I were doing um, in terms of strategy going forward for the business. You mentioned there that you've also now stepped down as CEO, which I think I ha- happened earlier this year, and you've put a CEO in place. How did you come to that decision? Well, it's something that I've been thinking about for a, a long time, to be honest. The um, Paul who stepped in as uh, CEO, um, I've known for 20 years. He was, he was probably my first real business mentor, um, I think. Um, and, you know, back in the days of Quaff, he was there helping me um, and all the businesses since. So he is a great CEO and I knew that. And it was just the time when I came in, in the 2018 and took over as Soul and we got the business into such a great place over the last couple of years. But it was, it was a lot. It was a lot of responsibility around things that I don't particularly enjoy. So um, as a CEO, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of governance and it's there's a lot of kind of process, a lot of uh, team management. There is a lot of um, things required um, going back into the board, etc. And me, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. And to find a great CEO who knows the business so well as he does is so hard. And so to find him has been um, really, really lucky um, in terms of what it, it gives me the ability to do, which is focus on the fun stuff that I love. And so my job now, uh, for the first six months, it, it was decided like last year when I pitched it to the board. And um, so the first kind of, you know, period of time was the handover. And that has taken some time because, you know, he's got to, like he's he's been on the board for a couple of years. He was our chairman. So he knew the business, but from a board level. So the first six months is all about him getting to know the day-to-day, the real um, internal parts of the business that um, make it work. And so he spent, you know, the first kind of six months doing that. And as he's got more and more involved in that and taken more and more off of my shoulders, I've spent time kind of looking at the opportunities for optimization and growth. So you go hand off the day-to-day, then what can I optimize, what can I grow quickly? And then uh, stage three is a 
about the what we, you know the innovation center the entrepreneurial bit which is where i get to really have some fun we saw another Australian e-commerce business adore beauty float recently. We were lucky enough to have Kate Morris on Curveball and they made a huge splash on the ASX. And in some of the articles about Adore Beauty's IPO, Vino Mofo is often mentioned in the same sentence. So is that something that you're toying with? Look, it's one of the options and despite the rumours, <laughs> it is just one of many options that we're looking at, to be honest. And I did hear... Um, Kate's interview. It was great, by the way. Um, Oh, thanks. (laughs) I've known Kate for a long time. She's great. There's a lot of similarities, I think, between the two of you coming out of um, garages. And so I'll be watching that space in case you uh, do the IPO float as well. Look, one of the other big, you know, curveballs that everyone has had, of course, is the global pandemic. You know, suddenly people at home last year with their families, they're becoming very interested in having alcohol delivered to their house. Um, Did that put pressure on your business in terms of existing stock and delivery systems or was it, you know, just another amazing little lucky charm where you just grew? Personally, I I just had our first baby. Um, So my wife and I were stuck at at home, locked up in Melbourne um, with... Great. Yes, great. (laughs) With no family support. You know, our families uh, live all over the country and none actually in Melbourne. So they were all planning to travel over to, to help us and support us and so we were there locked up in Melbourne by ourselves dealing with our first child and um, so yes it had its challenges personally (laughs) in terms of community around us too there was a lot of challenges because you know a lot of our friends and family are in you know on premise like restaurants and bars or uh, wine producers so while it was great for our business, um, for our community, it was like super challenging. So I've, I don't know how I feel about it in terms of um, it was so great for our business and, and, and meant we, had, we got to accelerate probably a couple of years in a period of like three months. Um, but then the community around me had a real mixed bag too. And then personally, it was a really challenging time because we were locked up in a house with a newborn and, you know, first time parents. And um, wow, that was really hard. I I imagine that with the pandemic that sort of China as a wine supplier has fallen in a hole and does this mean that Australian wine suppliers are able to go globally because we're sort of one of the few areas where the pandemic is relatively contained? The China thing is interesting for the industry. It's it's been quite challenging because, you know, it was our biggest export market. They were taking, you know, about $1.2 billion worth of Australian wine and that went to zero. And so that wine needs a home. And, you know, uh, you can look to other markets. You've got the US and UK that are reasonable size, but they're less than half that. So there's a lot of really great wine because they're also buying our super premium wine. You know, if, you know per litre, it was one of the two top markets. It's Singapore and um, China in terms of dollars per litre. And so that wine, that super premium wine, needs a home. You mentioned there this this network of founders, people like Kate Morris and other people who are running those pipelines and, and manufacturing lines and, and production lines during the pandemic. You know, Kate sort of mentioned that everyone was kind of calling each other. I'm wondering who's on speed dial for you when you need to hash something out or you need to kind of tease out a scenario? Oh, look, uh, the, the people, I was one of those ones on the Slack channel with Kate um, when she started that and um, obviously, you know, founders of Book, Booktopia, like uh, the Cash Guys. That I mean, it's such a tight-knit community, to be honest, um, that it's we all kind of look out for each other um, and we're all available and there's a lot of conversations that happen, you know, privately amongst us all. So it's um, it's, 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 it's been amazing to be part of that. Uh, community and um, it's we've certainly got a lot of support and help and advice uh, through those channels. Do you value mentoring? And I and I guess I mean that not just for you personally, but how do you build that in for the staff underneath you in your business? Uh, yeah, we we I absolutely do. It was one of the um, one of the things I didn't do early f- myself that I wish I had, um, but it wasn't as available as available as it is today in terms of like there's not the same startup communities, there's not the same um, ver- you know events and virtual events um, where you get to learn and talk and same panels and conferences and it just wasn't around when I was a kid. 
And so, um, one, it's just more available, which I think is fantastic. And um, as it's become more available, I've been more involved with it. And, you know, I've had coaches and mentors for the last um, decade. And so, what in terms of bringing that into the team, um, 100%, that's what we do. Um, uh, whether it's us personally or we bring in external coaches, um, actually, one of the... Um, coaches that Paul, the CEO, and I both share. Um, is a really super smart guy um, from the States. And so we've now brought him in to help the ELT, um, uh, develop as an ELT or executive leadership team, um, to develop as, a, as an ELT and then pass that down through the layers. So I think it's incredibly important, but it's certainly more available now than it ever has been. And just finally, what does long-term success look like for you, Justin Dry? You mentioned you and your wife have had a baby. What's the path forward for you now? Honestly, I think, uh, you know, Vina Mofo, I think, will end up being life's work. Uh, I, you know, I feel like we've just got through difficult teenage years and we're sitting in our 20s and we're excited. (laughs) Um, You know, we've got a couple of businesses within that at the moment and I see um, so much opportunity um, both here and um, uh, overseas when we can do that again. You know, we we operate in Singapore and it's doing really, really well, Um, but there's other markets that we would like to look at. But back in Australia, there's... There's so many opportunities, so many things that are bubbling away under the surface that um, that we'll talk more about in a little bit of time. <laughs> Next time you're on Kevball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, Justin Dry, it's been a wild ride indeed. I love that your surname also lines up with the brand somewhat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on Kevball. Thank you so much for having me. And I'd love to hear what you guys think of Curveball. Just open whichever podcast app you're listening in right now and leave us a rating and a review. It really helps other people find the show. But you can also shoot me an email or suggest a guest. You can email it to hello at deadsetstudios.com or you can visit our website, curveballshow.com. And make sure you're following Curveball so you always know when a brand new nugget of leadership goodness is there in your podcast feed. And that way you won't miss our next episode, which is kind of unusual. As I'm recording this, my wife and I are sitting down to crack a bottle of champagne to celebrate a year since our successful 13-year-old business went from a $6 million turnover to zero. (laughs) To zero zero dollar turnover. (laughs) That's next on Curveball, a husband and wife team who hit the open road when the going got tough in their business. You can also go back through the archives and hear how other entrepreneurs and leaders have moved from the garage to the stock exchange. Curveball's a production of Deadset Studios, a global podcast company. The executive producers on this show were myself and Rachel Fountain. This episode was edited by Rachel Fountain together with Liam Reardon. And thanks to Carl Hitchmo at iHeartRadio and ARN for studio recordings.